Good morning, Peter. Morning. Thank you so much for indulging in this podcast, this conversation today. I very much appreciate it. The last time that I saw you on a podcast, uh, MJ from the Fyro guys gave you an epic uh, introduction. I'm going <laughs> to try to somewhat, uh, somewhat match that. So today I have Peter Lim with me. Uh, Peter Lim, analyst at Capital Dynamics for five years, head of research at Coston Smith Asset Management for one year, fund management, UOB Asset Management, three years, seven months, fund manager, <laughs> Manulaf Investment Management for nine months, uh, head of equity, RHB Asset Management for two years and seven months, the CEO of Inter-Pacific Asset Management, two years, 11 months, head of research at Equities Tracker, that's where I met you, one year and three months, uh, currently the founder and chief research officer of Trident Analytics. Uh, it's been a six month journey for him since January of this year. Yeah. And of course, an author of best-selling book, MPH Best Set Business Reading 2020 book. Uh, what I learned as an analyst, the second edition got the award. So, yeah, talking to a man with uh, an awesome resume and pedigree here, but I just talked to you through LinkedIn, uh, by the way, where I got this information. Um, I have, as usual, a lot of questions and I always try to, uh, I, it's always a hard thing for me to do to learn to shut up when I interview my guests. Uh, personally, yesterday night, I couldn't sleep well. I think I tried to lie down at 1.30 or 1.15. I think I only fell asleep at 4. And I know... I keep saying that I'm not nervous every time I do a podcast, every time I interview a uh, guest, right? But maybe unconsciously I am. So I was rolling around my bed all the way till four in the morning. I checked my watch. I even, I checked my clock. I even, uh, when I even checked the football score of the Euros and I probably fall asleep about four or five. So just going to give a warning to audience out there that I may be a little bit low on energy today, but I'll try my best. Okay. So Peter, I'm going to ask you this question. And you told me as well that you find it hard to sleep at night. So <laughs> I'm going to ask your, fa your famous question, first thing first in this interview. Uh, what is keeping you up at night? Uh, <laughs> uh, honestly, tri Trident Analytics uh, do keep me awake at night. Um, you see, we have these monthly sessions, right? Where actually, you know, we, every end of the month, the last Sunday, we actually have a session. Then we talk about what are the major events that's happening, of course, in the world. And of course, this event must be market relevant, right? And also, we actually select an industry which we actually go deeper into it to actually understand. So the constant stress is, you know, whenever after the session, you feel relieved for a moment, but then the next stress comes out, what to talk next month? <laughs> <laughs> so it is that, that, that keeps me awake quite awake at night quite constantly you know it's like you know what to talk about what to talk about um, and, and the preparation work uh, yeah it's a monthly thing right usually take, you yeah. take a month to prepare a lot of this uh, presentation that you share with your members which I'm a part of as well subscriber yeah. of Trident you guys should all do so uh, <laughs> it takes you a month to prepare a lot of the things that goes behind the scenes it's a month long thing is it yeah it, it's constant because see the reason I put at the last Sunday is because we want to actually summarize what actually happened in the month, know what are the significant things, right? Mm. And then the second part of it is that you need to think about what industry is relevant in that month, which you think that people should know about or people should have an understanding, right? Say, for instance, um, this, this month we'll be talking about telecommunications, right? So again, if you look at the thoughts behind this, it's not just like randomly you choose, okay, let's talk about telco this month. Um, last month, then we talked about technology two months ago. Last month, we talked about auto, right? It's not something that randomly pop up. You know, that there's actually a thought process that goes in where you think which industry's knowledge is relevant going forward in the next maybe six months to 12 months, right? That maybe I see there's a potential in this industry. So that's for, therefore, I want to prepare uh, listeners that you know, have some basic knowledge for this industry mm. so that they're more aware of it. So it's, it's, that, it's that constant thought process of thinking of what is the topic that will be relevant to be checked in the coming session. And then goes to the preparation. You know, a, lot of, a lot of data needs to be collected. A lot of things need to be done. Yeah. Uh, is anyone helping you with this? Because it sounds like a team effort. Uh, that's, the, that's the problem. Uh, I am quite... I'm quite demanding in what I want. Uh, so for, uh, therefore, most of the time, I, I, I do the data myself. Because see, it, 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 it's something, it, it's hard to outsource this part of the work, unfortunately, right? Because sometimes as you gather data, actually, for instance, I may, I, may, I may think of that, I want to present this data in this format, for instance, at this angle. 
But as you're collecting the data, right? Sometimes, you no, know, in, in the midst of collecting, you you have a change of idea. Hey, maybe I want to present this idea in another format, and therefore I need another data. So from, from the beginning of, of the process of doing the research to the end, whatever you intended initially could be very different from the end result. Uh -huh. So that, that's why it's very hard for me to outsource this, this work. I, I can't really get an analyst, okay, you, you help me prepare all these things. No, I just give it to me, I'll present. It, it's hard for me to do it, right? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so that's, that's a challenge. <laughs> so it sounds like you're embracing your role as a solopreneur in trying to analytics. <laughs> Okay. And until I figure out how to outsource my brain. <laughs> that has always been the hardest part, I suppose, because yeah, everyone, everyone, I mean, we can, it's hard to take out what it is in our head and put it into someone else's, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for indulging in that question. I know that always comes uh, at the end of your interview with a lot of the <laughs> CEOs that you interview, but I, I, I'm just too curious. I need to hear it now. Okay. Peter, one of the quotes that you mentioned in your various interviews and your various features, that has really, um, and I don't say this lightly, like, that's really kind of changed my life. Uh, my approach to investing is that there is no right or wrong in investment. As a newbie investor, maybe just two years ago, coming into the markets and wanting to be an investor, right? Um, and having so many choices in the market to decide from what courses to take, what approaches should one go to, trading, investing, it's always been a very pressuring endeavor to decide um, what's right or what's wrong. And when I, when I read your quote, there's no right or wrong investment, I think it's in the H, the cover of the H. It gave me a huge sense of relief. Uh. And I love this because uh, the more I read about um, your history, right, I realized that your whole journey to where you are right now, there's really no right or wrong. Because uh, as I understand, your career as an analyst started out as, as you call it, a mistake, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and that's been well documented in a lot of the features that you were in. But, but I just want to go back a little bit further because um, I know you come from Johor Moa and yeah. I understand that one of your backgrounds that you have was uh, working in a factory. And this is part of the story that I don't think has been well covered in a lot of um, what people talk about when they talk to you. I would just like to hear your your reminiscing of what it was like working in a factory back when you were 13, 14? Yeah. I, I, I came from, a, 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 if, you, if you use the current terminology, I come from a B40 group. Um, my father is actually a bus conductor. You know, in the olden days, right? You know, when you travel from Moa to Batu Pahat, you know, got, got this kind of bus where, you know, there's no fixed bus stops. You know, every, every time when somebody wants to go down, they're passing, and then people go stop. And as you go up, you know, this, uh, this conductor actually tear the tickets to you. Mm. And that's actually my father's job. I mean, and, and those are times you really need to learn to be patient. You no, know, those those are times where you know people won't get down for hundred meters. You know, it's like when the bus just thing for stop, right? When the bus just barely moves and it barely reaches hundred meter, somebody else will press a thing again and then they just get out again. <laughs> so yeah, so so my, my father was a bus conductor. So mm. even at a very young young age, we, we don't really have the luxury to have whatever we want, right? So whatever we want, we have to work for it. So as you remember, I, I, the reason why I started working at 13 was actually for one that time. So I was in the afternoon shift, right? So I, I started working in the morning shift. So I went to this biscuit factory. You know, it's a very small cottage kind of factory, right? Just, just to earn an income, just I want to buy a bicycle. So that, that, was, that was the reason why. Uh. So I, I started off there. Um, and then in Form 3, when a slightly bigger size, you know, you're not able. Mm. I, I actually went to this factory where, you know, you, you know all those cupboards and wardrobes where they got all these cartoons printed on top of them. You know, those wooden cupboards, right, yeah. for the kids, right? I actually work in a factory that print these cartoons on the wall of those uh, wood panels, right? Okay. Uh, so those are Form 3, yeah. So when it comes to Form 4, uh, when you're more legally... Employable. <laughs> I, I must be <laughs> under the Malaysian law. Those are quite illegal workers, actually illegal workers back then, right? Um, so I actually started upgraded, upgraded, I actually worked in supermarkets. Um, you know, those those I'm not sure if it's this now, those supermarkets actually you know they sell clothes, clothing, you know, we have this, we call ourselves promoters, we are actually selling clothes, right? Um, yep. so I was working from four, from five, up all the way up to form six, um, as as um I don't want to call it apparel promoter selling clothes, um, shoes, belts, um, 
I, I always joke with my, I was there all the way from, from five until even in my uni days, whenever I got any holiday, I actually went back to, to work. So I always tell, tell my supervisor the joke is I nearly sold everything. The only thing they refused to let me sell is lingeries. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you never include this in your LinkedIn resume, huh? Three years as a factory, two years uh, working in uh, retail. Illegal worker, can <laughs> would, would be a nice, would be a nice addition to see the ascent of Peter Lim from where he was at 14, 15, 16, 17. Okay, one thing I do want to go into is, um, and I, I don't know whether this uh, is something you mentioned before or not, but you're quite the entrepreneurial person as well because in university, you started a business. I started an import business, uh, importing <laughs> something from China and selling it to the university students. Can you tell me a little bit about that? <laughs> oh, I, I, I forgot to mention that before. <laughs> I did my research. Uh, <laughs> but, no, no, no. Typically, when, no, no, when you are young, you always want to be successful. You always mm. want to, to, to make, make money. I mean, actually, actually, in the process of working in factories and whatnot, actually, I got involved in direct selling at the age of 15, when I was from three, I just started direct selling. And then after from five, I get involved in insurance. So, you know, all, all these ways of, you know, all these promises of wealth, making money, you know, I, I got involved in all those things, right? Mm. So when it comes to university, I, I think at the final year, I think it's 2003. Uh, my second, is okay, it's a bit tricky. It's not really my final year, but because I finished my, accounting is a four-year course in UM, University of Malaya, right? But I managed to finish in three and a half. Uh, I, I, I accelerated my, yeah, I finished in three and a half. So at, at the last semester, then I, I got involved with my friend. We started importing stationaries from China and we started selling stationaries in that sense. So, so 203, you don't really hear of China stationaries. I mean, to be more exact, you know, your, your pants, your ball pants, your, your gel pants, your, uh, they're still mainly your pilots and whatnot. So products from China or station of China is quite, quite new in, in the market. And we got really, really good price um, because we, we are quite early stage. We, we, we did not claim we are pioneer, but we are actually one of the first few of who's doing it. So we're actually really making very, very good profit out of it. Yeah. I think average profit per day, I think you're ranging around 700 a day. That's profit. That's profit. That's profit. Yes. And then we, that we, we don't give terms. We, we actually all is on cash terms. We don't give uh, credits or we don't give credits in, in a sense. Okay, okay. What what happened yeah. to the what happened to business since then? Um, see, what one very thing, two two things I learned in, in this venture. Um, the first thing is, me and partner. The, the first thing we struggled was with how to grow the business because there's a lot of trade secret involved, right? So we we realize once you start to hire a salesman to do it for you, they will learn your trade secret and and very fast they are able to replicate what you're doing, right? So we we haven't found a a system or mechanism of how do you expand this business without having people copying your business model, right? So that, that's the first thing where I make me realize that I need to learn more about how to run a business before I get involved in the business. I, I, I lack the business knowledge of how do you expand. No, you know how to do business, but you can't expand the business. The, the second thing that struck me was, no, as with all partnerships, right? At the moment, it begins initially, everything is okay. But as usual, you know, when money starts to come in, you know, there's going to be a lot of conflict and disagreement because it's already profitable. So I told my friend this, I said, well, I chose to pull out without taking out any capital. I said, whatever profit is, just leave it there. I withdraw myself from the partnership because I told you, you know, there's only, there's two possibilities, possible outcomes at the end of the day. If I have to stay in, in this business, mm. I don't think we are able to be friends. If I take myself out from this business and let you continue yourself, mm. we can still be friends. So my option was, I rather maintain our friendship rather than to actually continue with it together and end up you no know, being enemies because of all these conflicts. So that's the reason why I pull out of it. Well, what, okay, I'm curious, and this is I have a list of questions I want to ask, and I always sidetrack yeah. really early. But I'm really curious. Why do you think that's the case? Huh? Because it's it's a very common saying. People will say, "Oh, a hey, friend do business together, sure fail one, cannot one." Then friendship also gone down the window. Um, I had my personal share of a business failure and uh, mm. yeah, I'm no longer in talking terms with the partner as well. <laughs> and I look back and I, I know so many things that I did wrong as much as he did wrong, right? And mm. I, I want to take responsibility for that. But why do you think this is the case? Because I feel like if you can't trust a friend in working together to build something meaningful, who can you actually trust? 
Mm. But I, I, I'm not saying that <laughs> partnership with friends is totally no, 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 right? But it, it's going to be very, very minorities. There, there are, maybe look at the success rate, very, very good partnerships with friends. And this, maybe it's maybe 10% out of, uh, out of 100%. Mm. Right. There are success cases, but you really need to find one where you no know, the, the mindset is really the same. Right. So to, to make it work, it's not easy. It's, it's really, really not easy. Right. You know, a lot of criteria need to come into my life. Most most to me, the most fundamental things. I, I'll be, if I be very direct, I are we cal- a calculative person? Generally, I'm not a calculative person. Right. So you need a partner who's also not calculative. Then yes, that friendship or that friendship and together that partnership can work for the long term. But if you try to work with a very calculative person, mm. right? And if you're also calculative, then it, it's, it's very hard to work in that sense. Okay. Well, it sounds to me that's why companies need to have um, CEOs and then CFO roles separately like, in a way, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Back to uh, back to the main, <laughs> the main program then. After uni, you went to work as a consultant. Am I right? Uh, no, I went, okay, um, I went into audit firm for a month. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, actually, actually, even the accounting, okay. No, after STPM, I, I took the Form 6 journey, right? Um, honestly, I, I, what, what I really wanted to do was law. Uh, my childhood ambition is actually to be a lawyer. Mm. Right, so I, I had my mind set up, right? Not after from five, I'm going to college to study A level. I'm going to pursue my my, my legal degree. Uh, but what actually happened that time was you no, know, my, my father's EPF actually ran out uh, because my my brother took law, <laughs> my sister also took law. So when it comes to my turn, and I'm, I'm the last child of the family, uh, my, my father's EPF is finished. <laughs> There's no more money, so I, I'm, I have to go through the STPM level of the form six level. Um, so even that night, I, I was quite involved in doing direct selling, right? So even after I get my SD, SDPM result, my, actually, I don't intend to further my studies. I was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm doing quite well in, in my direct selling, right? Why, why should I study? You know, why should I get a degree? Because I'm already making income out of this. So what was, so when the, when the, those days, uh, those are 2000, the year 1999. So even your application letter for university is still in the hard copy. No, I still remember it's quite a big hard copy, right? Mm. No, no online way back then. So I actually threw it to my, my teacher at that time. I said, ah, you guys feel whatever you want, right? You all, you all choose whatever course you want. And, and the other one actually applied, applied all the courses for me. I, I was not involved. Uh, so when the letter came, you know, I was actually admitted to UM accounting. Mm. Uh, so even when I go in that time, I don't really intend to study. That's the reason why I, I, I want to get out as far as soon as possible to work to earn income. So that's why I accelerated the whole program to come out in three and a half years, right? Um, then, remember I mentioned one of the reasons, one thing that made me realize was in, in the in the stationary business where I don't have knowledge in running a business. Mm. So the thought that came to mind at that time was, so how do I learn, or where can I learn about businesses, how to conduct businesses? So that time, the logical answer is be an auditor because apparently being an auditor, you get to audit companies, right? And in the process of, auditing companies, I assume that I will learn about how they do the business. And that's the reason why I went into audit line after I graduated. Um, but uh, instant regret. For one month. <laughs> no, in the first time, yes, I regretted. <laughs> uh, so so that, that, that was the reason why I went to audit. Mm. And then I got out of audit. Because I realized we don't really learn about businesses as an auditor. You, you learn more about verifying the numbers, right? Or checking the numbers to make sure that the numbers are true and fair. Mm. You don't really get involved and really understand how the business is conducted, what is a competitive advantage, so on and so forth. You were in that job for one month, as you yeah. mentioned. Um, and that was your first job after coming out of graduation, right? Mm. What, what gave you the courage to leave it? Because for most people, having mm. secured a job, I mean, they would want to die, die, kind of see it through. Like, in my opinion, like, maybe that's not so true for maybe this generation. But what really gave you the courage was, <laughs> as I understand, you mentioned that success slash uh, financial success was very important to you. I don't know. Because, see, when, when you are young, I, I, I always tell my juniors this, right? After graduating, your first three years is your honeymoon. What I mean by honeymoon is, in the first three years, you you are you have this 
flexibility or this luxury mm. to change job and to find a job that suits you. Three years. Okay, why three years? It's very simple. So assuming now, if I just graduated, I joined this company after three months, I don't like it, I change. Then the interviewer asks, why do you change job? I'm exploring and I don't think I like it. So people can still accept that reasoning for first three years. Mm. But if you try to do that after three years, uh, people will think, hey, you know what the hell have you been doing for the last three years? You, you see I'm coming from? So my, my advice usually to fresh graduate is, if you don't know what you want to do, explore. I mean, you, you have the first three years after graduation to actually explore what you really like to do. So, so don't be so worried about, not. I joined this company, it's like a, what do you call that? Uh, it's like a lifetime sales and purchase agreement where you actually sold your soul for the lifetime. No, I mean, after a few months, we think that we realize, hey, no, this is not what I wanted to do, right? I mean, explore. Go and, go and explore other fields that just you never know what you like until you try. But don't do it for the long term. I say, no, your, your window of luxury is only the first three years. Okay, okay. After the three years, don't, don't, don't try the same thing and expect to do it after five years to do the same thing, right? You know, you'll get very different answer from, from your employers. Okay, I like that. Practical advice. It, uh, it very much echoes the YOLO sentiment of the millennial these days. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> YOLO, you only live once. So if you really don't like your job, uh, I mean, it's easier said than done, of course. Don't like your job, go quit it and try something that you enjoy. La. Start a Actually, cafe I got, or whatever. I, I got different view on that. Actually, I wouldn't say you only live once. No? Technically, you only die once. You live every day. <laughs> I always like how you. I always like how you are able to spin, you know, the most uh, common quotes and then uh, spin it to the opposite, and it kind of still makes sense, la. Okay, <laughs> so you only die once, yo do. I will take that into part. Okay, moving on, right? Um, and beyond that, that's when you started your career as an analyst. Yeah. Uh, and it's been a long career as an analyst, all the way from from the second job all the way till your uh, interpacific role. Um, can you walk? Can you walk me through just quickly, right? Walk me through. How you felt um, when you switched a job from being a consultant, being an auditor to being an analyst? Uh, it's, it's quite easy because honestly, I was, I was only an auditor for a month. <laughs> so, uh, it, 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 it was quite quite an easy, quite an easy switch. I mean, there's really not much thing. Um, I think I think I just mentioned quite, quite well. So I got into the analyst by accident. I, I just wanted to get out from audit, so I applied any job without knowing what they are about. So then I applied to Capital Dynamics. I just saw that time there's a small caricature about cartoon in the Star advertisement. So I just applied, right? So, and that time the application is you no know, still your brown paper envelope. You know, you print hard copies, you know, send paper envelopes, all your resumes and whatnot. So I got a call. Well, I still remember that the, the first two questions they asked me in my first interview, right? So the first asked me, so have you heard about us? And my answer is no. Uh, then do you know what do you do? And my answer is no, I don't know what you do. <laughs> Miracle that you still got a job. Uh, and there's actually more to that. Actually, yes, they actually give you three hours, right? They give you an essay assignment. Mm. So I mean, there's three questions. You, just, you need to choose one of the three and they give you three hours to write an essay to explain about any of the three, any of the one that you chose. But I still remember I chose explain time value of money, right? So I, only, I, I, I remember I only wrote one sentence, but I can't remember what I wrote. But I really only wrote, wrote a sentence, right? So it's a five minutes I submit my paper. So <laughs> they, they, they were like, you got three hours to write. And then my answer was, yeah, but if I can explain in one sentence, why do I need to use three hours to explain what I can explain in one sentence? So I just submit. <laughs> Brave man. So you're not, you're not brainwashed by the traditional uh, education system where they, uh, they force you to churn out as much as you possibly can, you know, like, I give you this paper, this two, three pages of paper, you got to fill it up. The word limit is at least 1,000 pages, 1,000 words or something like that. <laughs> okay, okay. The reason why I ask that is because, um, and again, as we can all see through your accolades, through, uh, through, through what you have done. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm making it awkward by saying all your successes and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but, but really, one thing, one thing that I really wish to know, and of course, if you're keen to share, of course, is... I understand that you, you had a really good run in 2012 all the way to 2017. Uh, that's when you won the best performing local fund manager. Am I right? Uh, I, actually, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't win that award. Mm. Uh, it was, what to call that? Um, it, it, it's, like a, it's like a title mm. being given by Bloomberg. Right? That's really no official award to be the best fund manager. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Bloomberg though, I gotta say. Okay, okay. Uh, Bloomberg ran at, came at, came over and gave an uh, interview. So uh, that, that time really did very well. So mm. they, they, in, in the headlines, they gave this title that you know, is the best performing. So that's, I must clarify, there's really no official award that you are the best, best performing okay, from Asia. Okay. Thanks, for, thanks uh, for the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what happened is, um, throughout the years, right? See, you know, unit trust, there's always this thing called the Lippert Award where they actually, every year they measure who are the best unit trust based on categories, right? You know, there's Malaysia category, equity category, balance category, so on and so forth. Um, so actually, I have been winning awards for the fund. Okay, not me winning awards. Right? But the fund that I managed, managed have been winning awards even since 2012, 13 and all the way until 2018. Mm. Right? But it's just, you don't go and publish it. You know, I, I managed this fund, I won this awards. Right? Yeah, so so that's the reason why some some there are some parties who, who actually call me as multi awards winning fund manager. So actually, this this actually comes from the little awards that I won throughout the career from as as a fund manager, and, and that's actually how I built my my CV or, or or the reputation in the industry. Yeah, I'm curious though why why not why not um kind of use that as a marketing a way to market your fund because. Funds are always marketed in a way like, oh, this is our return last year. This is what we mm. did. This is what award we've won. Why couldn't that be a way to kind of market the fund? No, no. They, they do market the funds, but they don't market the fund manager. So uh, we are like the, okay. the, the, the hidden guy behind, you know, that, that does all the jobs. Okay, okay. But, but those, those who knows me, they know. But those who don't know, they don't know. Okay, <laughs> okay. I see. Well, you're a more front-facing person now, I gotta say. That's why. We should all, we should all know. Accolades. Before we did this podcast uh, and there was a slight delay and I mentioned the word Murphy's Law, whatever could go wrong can go wrong. Uh, yeah. The camera wasn't working, the laptop froze and whatnot. So we had a mini technical glitch. Um, but Murphy's Law is something that you experience uh, quite extensively in 2018 and 2019. Uh, in your book, you mentioned that it was one of the toughest periods uh, of your career as an analyst. Um, and of course, if you don't mind, could you walk us through what happened during that time though? You see, the, when the article in Bloomberg came out, I think it was 2017, right? Mm. Um, it, it, I've been pretty low profile, as I mentioned. I, I, I like to maintain a low profile, but, but the article really uh, put me in the limelight for a wrong reason, because of the headline. You know the headline? <laughs> Uh, yeah, for, for, for the wrong reason. So, and that time, our, our funds, the fund that we managed was in, under Interpac, we, really, we, we actually won awards. And that was the first time I think we won three awards for two funds winning three awards. Um, for a small company like, like Interpac, actually it's quite, mm. quite, you know, it's quite like, wow, I'm get kind of thing, right? So, so that actually gives a, a lot of pressure. Um, so when 2018 came, um, from the top, it actually fell to the bottom. Uh, what was really challenging that time was the analysis was right, um, but the share price that or the share price of the company invested in did not perform as what you think. So that is the divergence between. So I was explain this way: why it was challenging in two thousand eighteen when Trump started this crusade against the trade war against China, especially mm -hmm. on the technology front. Right, um, our, our view is that it is is it's going to have a more reverse impact. I mean to say it is going to be stimulate more of Malaysian tech companies rather than being like. You no know, cutting down on their on their orders. So on, on that front, we were right. If you look at in terms of 2018, the tech earnings of Malaysian companies are still going up trend. But because of this trade one sentiment against that, right, the share price actually went down trend. So it was actually uh, no, it's just like wow, no, like, what else to do? You no, know, you got the you got the concept, right? But the share price not performing to it. And adding to that, I was also playing the role of a CEO. So you no, know, everything's falls on your head to a certain extent. You, know, you run the organization. Mm. You need to run, manage the budget. You need to actually have, you know, to, to, how should I put it, to, to have a growth plan, how to expand the business, so on and so forth, right? Um, so it's, it's a multiple pressure, all, go, all goes together. So on that. And so it was a very difficult period because of that. How, how do you manage through that though? You're still here today. You Ooh. are, in our eyes, um, doing more than ever, in my opinion. I've only known you in the past two years. Uh, but yeah, how did you, how did you manage that though? Well, it was a very big learning curve. Um, I, I, I will say I managed, I managed that. I think I, think I, I hit my, my patience level in 
August 2019. Uh, that, that's when I, I call it quits. Uh, I say, mm. uh, you know, uh, and, and yeah, but, no, with, as with all bots, right? As with all bots, that's realistic. There's always this boardroom politics, right? Uh, which is something I'm very, very bad at. And it actually drains out a lot of my energy. So by August 2019, I actually told them, I said, guys, I have enough of all the boardroom politics. I said, I, I'm here. I, I said, my, my, I want to say my expertise, right? I, I'm, the only thing I'm good at is managing funds, right? I, I'm not good at all these politics and whatnot, right? So that's why I call it quits um, by 2019. I said, I said enough is enough, right? Okay, okay. How, how, so how, the lesson that I learned is, if you now ask me to join any, any big organization, I say, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. So, Thanks for sharing that. Um, you've always been the uh, the vibe that you give me is you've you've always been a very kind, gentle person. As much as you don't say that in your social media, you say you can be very harsh and very blunt. <laughs> but uh, deep inside, you're a soft teddy bear. I gotta say, Peter. <laughs> At least in my opinion, <laughs> um, Through your through one of the articles that I read about you is, and this is how tough it was for you based on what you've shared. Right, it was at a point where you were so unsure about your method, methods, so unsure about the way you're managing things that you almost considered trading uh, trading as a way rather than investing. Yeah. And that was really a lot. Of, that, that must have taken a lot out of you to really question your fundamental and basic methodology to, to want to go through that change. It's quite pressure because, see, um, imagine, right? You, you, you have a lot of investors, even in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., texting you, asking you what happened to the fund. <laughs> wow. I'm not kidding you. Right? It is, it's very stressful. Um, and and that, that market environment, actually trading works, right? It's, it's just like now, you know, the mini stocks, right? You know, it's like, there's no fundamental, but mm. the share price will go up. So that, that strategy actually works in 2018 and 19. So as long as your trader, actually, you're, you're doing quite well doing that period. Um, up to actually what I didn't mention was actually I also hired uh, a head of equity. So I got to the point where, I, as I say, you know, maybe I'm no longer suitable to manage fund. So I actually hired a head of equity to actually overtake that role, mm. right? To actually compensate for maybe my, my, my incompetence, to be very honest, right? During those periods. So I even did that, you know, that actually, I just had, had to actually look after the funds too. So, so that I can, you know, Honestly, I'm thinking that maybe I'm incompetent to actually do it during that period. Okay. okay. So it, it was quite a, quite a tough period. Thank you for being candid and authentic. <laughs> and open. Um, okay, we've gone through Peter Lim's whole life story now. Yay. <laughs> uh, okay, one thing that I hear from your story, right, from when you were young until um, your past career as an analyst is um, you've been a very hungry person. You are, especially when you were young, you're hungry for success, for kind of financial mm -hmm. gain and one thing to kind of make it in life, for lack of a better word, right? Um, how, how, how did you view success? How did you used to view success? Well, typically, I still remember no, when you're teenagers, right? Um, um, you always feel success as you know, you, you drive a luxury car, you, know, you own a BM, you live in a bungalow, you, know, you have a five-figure income. You know? That time, five-figure income was like, wow, not everyone wants to have a five-figure income, right? Those are coming, yeah. No, but because of inflationary rate, you know, those times, five-figure income is different from this type of income, mm. right? So, yeah, but I think, I think over the years, you start to realize that, I think for, for me, how the measure success is, whether do I live a meaningful life? Mm. Or whether while while you are on the face of in the earth or on the face of earth, right? Have you actually put in your effort to actually try to contribute in in any ways? It can be very very little ways or in any any ways. So that at the end of the day, see, let, let's come let's come to be very realistic about it. We we all will die one day. So dying actually is not the scary thing, right? To me, what is a scary thing is imagine people say, you know, your life will flash before you, I don't know, in a few seconds before you pass away. Nobody actually needs to verify that, but just assume it's a few seconds before you pass away, right? The, the scary part is what will you regret at those last fleeting moments? Right? What will you regret not doing? Will you regret not buying that seven series? Will you regret not selling in a big bungalow? Or, or, or will you regret not living a meaningful life? Okay, okay. But how do you come to that point? Because 
it's a, it's a huge change um, in your past life of, um, and this, this, is, this is part of the email that I sent to you, right? One thing that I've always been very fascinated by you is that you are one of the most sensible person, uh, at least in my opinion, I know you're going to, you're going to defute that. <laughs> you're one of the most sensible person when it comes to the financial capital markets, right? But you've always been, you always had a predisposition towards charity work and towards um, to the opposite of accumulating wealth, uh, dispersing wealth and giving wealth to the people in need. Uh, and I'm just going to quote you here. One thing that you said is, I would like to have a Mercedes Benz and live in a bungalow. They are nice, but are they necessary? Most of my money goes to charitable causes. I don't keep much for myself, says Lim. Um, but why, why, when did that change? When did that shift change from the person in uni working odd jobs, trying to get as much income as possible to who you are now? I think that there's really no no single event that you no know, one day wow no after the event started away. I think it's, it's a gradual understanding of the world and a gradual realizing that you no know, there is actually much more in life than just trying to accumulate wealth. See, to me, I'm not against accumulating wealth. Don't don't get me wrong, right? I, I think making this this is the world that we live in, right? I wouldn't kind of tell you money is not important, right? Money is important, but to me. The line is being drawn where whether is it the right um, are you making the money in the right way or are you making money in excessive way? I, I think that that's where I'll draw the differences, right? To me, it's right to make money. I think business need to make money. Let's be realistic. Any job, any effort, you need to earn an income. But let's not go to the greed aspect of it where you want to earn a lot out of it. Right? Earn to what you think you are comfortable. You can live a comfortable life depending on what you serve, depending on comfortable life. And there's really no harm to actually distribute back the rest of society. You see, everything goes in a cycle. See, we may not think that we don't owe society anything, mm. but you're wrong, or we are wrong, right? See, everything we own today comes from the society, All right? Let, let's take this podcast, for instance, right? Mm. People that you know, or even people that you don't know, will contribute to the success of this podcast, correct? Mm. And they are the society. So be, say my parents, for instance, or my father, for instance, he's a bus conductor, right? And his income actually comes from all the passengers, which he doesn't know who they are, but because they take the ride from the bus from Moa to Batu Pahat, their contribution of the bus fare contributes to the company, which then contributes to his salary. Which then contributes to you. Exactly. So, so it is hard to deny the fact whatever we have or whatever we are now actually come from society or say plays a role to bring to where we are today. Right? So that's why also my, my thing is since we receive from the society, we must give back the portion of it back to the society. Okay, okay. There, there is this, um, there's this quote that I've always been thinking about, right? Not so much quote, but more of an example. Um, that one has to be effectively selfish in the first part of their life or whatever duration one should quantify it to be effectively mm. altruistic in the second phase of their life. And the example that they shared was, and again, this is a bad example. And not a lot of uh, people are going to bash me for this, but it goes <laughs> like this, right? It goes like uh, Mother Teresa, she worked her entire life to help uh, save children um, through poverty, through disease. Bill Gates writes a check for a few billion dollars and he wipes out uh, malaria, wipes out malaria in Africa. And one can argue that he, in fact, done a better and bigger job like, because he had much more capital um, control, capital access, and he had much more money, like, just put it plainly. And, and in fact, I won't talk to the FIRO guys about this, right? And they were very much in agreement with this. So I'm curious to hear what your thought about this is. You know, as the beginning of this thing, as this session mentioned correctly, there's actually no right and no wrong. Um, see, everybody has their own way of contributing to society, right? And let's be realistic. How many Bill Gates are there in the world? Yeah. I mean, it's being very sick, right? That's the first aspect of it. So, okay, let us take, for instance, assuming I want to go through the path of Bill Gates, right? I'll say, okay, no, in the first 30 years, I'm going to be very selfish. I'm going to accumulate my wealth so that, you no, know, after the 30 years, I have enough capital for me to do a bigger thing like what Bill Gates is doing, assuming, right? But in if you take the other perspective of it, if, if a child is hungry today, the child is hungry today. Can you ask the child to actually please control your stomach, wait for me for 30 years later, let me accumulate my wealth first, before I can be able to actually serve you the food. 
You, you see where I'm coming from? Mm. So Mother Teresa has her own mission, has her own way of actually serving humanity. Bill Gates has his own way of serving humanity. Either way, nobody's right and nobody's wrong. The, the difference is, and there was a friend who asked me this question, as I paid the same question, they said, why, why don't you save money? And they actually give me the other example, Warren Buffett. They said, why, why? They said, they said I'm an investor. They said, why don't I follow Warren Buffett style? You just accumulate your wealth first. Wait until maybe you're 50 years old, right? And then you have a bigger pool that you can give more. I give the same answer. I say, look, if a family is in poverty now, they have no food on the table, we should solve that. Why should I say, hey, wait, wait, no, let, let me do my wife first, wait for me later, then only I start to give it to you. You see, a very interesting part, you know, you know the epic story of uh, Ramayana, right? You know, you know Lord Rama, you know, on, on this battle to Sri Lanka, from India to Sri Lanka, he's had to build a, 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 a bridge made of rocks. Right. So, of course, got all those muscular people cutting rocks. Mm. What was interesting that time, even the small squirrel was actually carrying little, little pebbles and contribute to that. So, all the other people helping there, they're all laughing at the squirrel. They said, hey, you know, what can a little pebble do to, to build this major rock bridge, right? But then what Lord Rama mentioned was, they are doing to their effort to best they can. So even their little contribution is to their best effort and which is something that is very cherishable, cherishable it's very uh, precious in, in that sense, right? So likewise, we doesn't mean to do good or to contribute, we need to contribute in a big way like what our friend Bill Gates is doing. Okay, not my friend. I know him, but he doesn't know me, right? But <laughs> any act of kindness, regardless of quantum, regardless of size, it's a good effort. Got it. Got it. Thank you for sharing. Something I'll be thinking about a lot. Uh, yeah, this is a question that I've always, it's not a question that I get an answer to, but I realize that every time I ask it, every time I hear different opinions, um, it it just deepens the complexity of how I personally should answer this question to my own life. So thanks for sharing your insight on that. Um, you've got charity and spirituality as a journey. And it's something that, until today, it still unravels and you learn something about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, what changes though did you experience through this journey? What's the biggest insight that you've learned? The biggest is actually self-transformation. Mm -hmm. right? um, let me more explain. There's actually no, no, no destination in, in this future journey. Right? There is nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to gain. There's nothing to get out of it. It's not like there's, there's a pile of treasure at the end of this journey, right? Once you go there, you found the pile, means, yeah, no, got it. I'm spiritual now, right? <laughs> <laughs> there's no, no such thing. Spirituality is actually a, a, a constant path of self-transformation or self-progress. And it's, it's a continuous journey. You know, there is really no end to it. But, okay, now I'm a saint. You know, it, it doesn't work that way. So I'm just a work in progress. And it will continue to be a work in progress. It is, mm. It's a work that will never be done. Okay, okay. Would you say this goes against being an investor? Because as an investor, there should be a defined, and I might be wrong on this, but there, there should somewhat be a defined end goal to what you want to achieve. And I, I know you, you have uh, famously said that uh, you got to define you're 10% this year. If you get 10%, then you should be happy with it. Get 12%, Hello. don't compare with someone who has done 20%. <laughs> Would you say, and because this question that I want to ask next is, how does being more spiritual and being on this journey of charity made you a better investor? It's a very leading question. I shouldn't have worded it that way. But mm -hmm. when you describe it that way, describe it as a journey with no end, I feel like it contradicts and it clashes a lot with how being an investor is though. Not, not really. You see, on a multiple aspect, right? Mm -hmm. There's this a multiple aspect uh, thing. The first thing is look at it in terms of your mindset, right? Mm -hmm. um, it gives you the clarity of not being too greedy, right? Like, I always say, say, for instance, if you think about it the other way, you now say, for instance, theoretically, say if I pay, if I buy Maybank, for instance, right? And I think that Maybank's maximum value is 15 ringgit, mm -hmm. okay? So that, that's like 15 ringgit. So imagine if I hang on and I manage to sell at 15 ringgit, Right, so I'm very happy. I said, "Well, this is the max of the value it goes." And for me to sell at fifteen ringgit in Maybank, there must be another party that's buying Maybank at fifteen ringgit, mm. right? So if I think the value of Maybank maximum is fifteen ringgit, that means whoever is buying from me 
they will be incurring losses. True? Yep, yep. So that's why I always say that always leave some profit for other people. So why you need to wait for Maybank until it's 15 ringgit? If I buy at 10 ringgit, I can sell at 13 ringgit and make 30% and I'm happy. So at least whoever that's buying me from me at 13 ringgit, know there's still a potential for them to actually make some additional gain and not to incur losses. I see. Okay. Right. So it's I say it's like a sharing of wealth in that sense. So so it's that greed part that you no, know, you have really have to manage. And and then I would say I'm quite reluctant to use the word spirituality in this, but having a more wider perspective or or, or may just call it a lesser greed uh, rather than use the, the big word spirituality. Okay. That way it really helps to actually the mindset that you wouldn't say, ah yeah, no why they said it's 13 ringgit. No, why don't I? You always start to look back, right? I saw it's 13 ringgit. Hey, no, it's 15 ringgit. No, like, why, why should I sell it? No, it, it, it helps in that sense. No, it's not 13 ringgit. Uh, it gets to 13 ringgit, 20 cents, so beta tahan really. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> and, and on the part of never ending, you see, re- research is never ending. It is never ending. So more time we, we think that, you no, know, I will do my research, right? Say, back to say Telecom or, or Maybank again, right? Mm. So they say, oh, I've done my research and buy Maybank. Okay, that's it. But I think what people fail to understand is your research on Maybank accelerate, increases after you buy it because now your money is made. Mm. So there is really no end to research. Research is a constant ongoing and there's no end to it. There is no, no analyst in the world saying that, okay, now I know 100% of this company. It is absolutely impossible. Even if even the owner won't be able to claim, I know 100% of this company, right? what more a third party analysis? So again, realizing that there is really no end to analysis. It is also a continuous journey in that sense. To add to that, right? honestly, I think that confidence is something that's been very highly valued in, in the broad world, society these days. And I find that for some reason, I'm very sensitive towards very, very confident people. And mm-hmm. that is one of the reasons why I've chosen uh, some of the investment courses that I take, some of the investment subscriptions that I subscribe to is because the people that I trust are the ones that they know what they're talking about. They they do their research, but they tell you that they are not sure. And that being able to take a step back and being gracious enough or humble enough to say that they're not sure because a lot of things is out of your control is something that I'm very attracted to and I'm very keen to learn from people like that. Something I just mm-hmm. want to mention. Yeah. Yep. And and it echoes what you say, like, because the really no one really knows hundred percent what's what's um what's true and what's not true, right? But okay, you mentioned that you were reluctant to use the word spirituality. So when mm-hmm. I when I say the word spirituality, what comes to your mind? <laughs> uh, I, I, for, for me, it's spirituality, I was thinking my, 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 I, I know it's not right, but you no, know, the first tendency of my is those holy men. <laughs> Okay, okay. Why, uh, why, why, why does that, why does that pop in your head? Why, why do you have a sensitivity or aversion towards using that word? I, I realize that in you. No, no to, to me, I think that it's, it's a very big word. Um, for me, for me, it's a very big word for me that I, I, uh, I, I don't think I'm able to carry that word. You know, it's just, just some, some of the things that is said and how I feel most of the time, right? I think, I think it's, it's a very, so, yeah, no, I wouldn't want to claim I'm a spiritual person because I don't think I'm able to carry that, the weight of that, of that word. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. Okay, I'm trying to picture what the holy man image is in my head <laughs> right now. <laughs> okay, but, but okay, the reason why I ask that is because, and the reason why this is such an important segment for me, uh, and again, this podcast is very selfish. Like, it is a lot of, um, it's an excuse for me to, to interview amazing guests like you. Uh, in the preface that, hey, this is going to be something that you can use to promote yourself. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sidetrack, sidetrack. <laughs> but I, I, the reason why I, I go back to the word spirituality because is because I find that I relate the word kind of to answers. Being spiritual, being enlightened means uh, finding answers. And I would say that I have a very scarcity mindset. And that scarcity mindset um, whether it's through childhood, through family, through what personal beliefs, uh, has led me to a point in life where I feel like, hey, I've accumulated okay enough for my age or compared to uh, people around me. And I've reached a point where I feel like this custody mindset isn't, uh, isn't feeding me well anymore. It's detrimental. 
but I'm also very afraid to relinquish it. And I I know this sounds very weird, but I've always found that um, the biggest joy at this point in my life comes when I am able to contribute and help. Hence, my career as a fitness trainer, my main career as a fitness trainer, um, has always been very rewarding to me because uh, helping people figure out answers to their problems is something that I've always get joy from. But I still struggle with this ghastly mindset. I still struggle with, oh shit, what if I don't get enough uh, next month? So I better keep this amount in my bank. I shouldn't waste it or I shouldn't, I'll do charity much later when I'm more quote unquote successful. Mm -hmm. And it feels to me like your journey, you've came to a point where you are able to, uh, your spiritual journey, sorry to use that word. I'm trying to figure (laughs) out a substitute to it. Your spiritual journey has brought you to a point where you're comfortable uh, relinquishing it all. Is it fair to say that though? Yeah, I can say, yeah, you can say that. Okay. Yeah. How does it feel? How does it feel when you give it away? Ultimately, is my 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 take is this right? Um, trust the universe. I mean, personally, I, I trust the universe, right? Mm. If things are meant to happen, they will happen. If things are not meant to happen, it will happen. So, so things will actually take care of it for itself or by itself. That's that's what I believe. Right? Okay. This conversation so far has been very fascinating to me because uh, as much as I like the, the the quote, trust the universe, I mean, you can control as much as you can control, but the universe is still going to go its way, right? That's not going to be a very popular term to use with investors when you say, hey, how are this stock going down? Trust the universe. <laughs> right? But maybe, maybe you can use that. Some investors might, might, might embrace that. <laughs> I'll try that. I'll try that. <laughs> trust the universe, guys. This stock will go up. Um, <laughs> Last question in regards to, to charity, uh, because I know you run a school and I know you're, you've always been very involved with the charity, charitable cause and the charity that you run. Um, and this, this is a very funny, funny story because I have friends who are very against, I mean, you walk around the streets, you have people coming up to you and say, hey, um, this charity needs help, this bunch of children or this old people, mm. they need money, donate, can you just offer this amount of money? And to be fair, it's important to be skeptical. You ask questions like, where does this money go to? You sure or not? I hear about this scam. People are cheating this money. You sure this money go to? 90% of this money goes to your organization, not to these old people. Mm. Um, it's always hard for me to decide what's right to choose. It's a personal mm. struggle of mine. So I'd like to know what your thought process is on choosing the right charity though. Actually, you think about it, actually, there's, there's no right or there's no wrong. <laughs> if you think about it, right? Okay, let, let's take, for instance, an inst- okay. okay, let's take the, the usual scenario. One, 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 one kid or one guy or one lady come out and say, okay, I'm going to ask you to donate. Um, this goes to this home, this home, this home. Mm. But you really take a step back out of it, right? What is important is what is your mindset. If your mindset is, I'm, I have the intention to give. I want to be generous. I want to help out. Then we give how they utilize it, whether is it rightfully or wrongfully, that is not your karma, right? That is their karma to their carry. So what is important is your action at that point in time. Mm. But if you start to give, and after giving, you have this mindset, you start to be suspicious. Then why give? You see I'm coming from? Then on the other hand, say if you give 10 ringgit, even assuming that it's not being used in the right way, you're poor by 10 ringgit. It, it, it don't cost you an arm or an mm. So I'm trying to say is, for me, I usually, when people come, I'll give. I, w- I will give just because I want to give. And I won't go and judge or go and play in my mind. No, are these people real? Are these people fake? Are they real beggars? Uh, are they part of a bigger society or association or a bigger syndicate? Like, no. I'm giving at that point in time because I feel like I want to give. Mm. and full stop know that there's really no more thoughts about speculation about what will happen after that okay. because ultimately that's their own karma to carry not my karma to carry and I, I don't feel that I'm poor by 10 ringgit or even 20 ringgit right I mean if it's a thousand two thousand okay that's a different story but it, it doesn't make you it really doesn't cost you much just just give based mm. on the sincerity and your compassion right how they want to use it that's their problem okay 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 good tip good tip I'll think about that. <laughs> now, in our email exchange, I have mentioned that I will try to not touch on investment. Uh, but <laughs> from, 
But based on popular requests, Peter, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Uh, but okay, these are going to be very broad questions. I want to ask you specifically what stocks and whatnot. And again, the disclaimer, this is not a buy-sell call by any means, whatever advice you learn from this podcast. Yeah. Uh, okay, you've been a huge advocate on not buying things or not touching things that you don't understand. And this has been kind of like your guiding, your guiding tenet through your career, right? Uh, and one thing that I read about um, during your first few years as an analyst is that you don't have Bloomberg, you don't have any access to data, you have to produce things from scratch. I'm curious, uh, I'm just curious, I'm going to ask this very badly worded question. How? <laughs> Way back in 2003, you have internet access, but you don't have broadband access. Then that's what so so um what what happened that time was you no know, my first job, Capital Dynamics, right? Um they have a very good training method. It's really good. I'm really sincere, I mean it's good. So we don't have Bloomberg. So the most we have an internet actually go to it. And the thing is, if you notice most of our all our emails, right? There's only one email. So everybody share the same email, mm. which is um owned by the boss. So even when if any brokers, they want to send you any research notes, right? You won't get it. I mean, there's no way you, you're able to get it. So you're really shut off from what is happening outside, right? You don't know what's, what people are calling a buy, what people are calling a sell. No. And, and that time, there's two old three, lah, you, know, you don't have all this. It's a very different world back then. Mm. So how do you do research? It's really very traditional. Um, I remember my, my first job was being, my, my first assignment was analyzing textile industry. Um, so what happened is my, my boss gave me this, no longer as this, not the yellow pages for business. So he really gave me a, a, a yellow pages put on my table. Mm. So what I do is my job is to flip onto the section textile. So all the listing of textile companies are there, right? Mm. You call one by one. No? And it's quite a standard phase. I mean, I, I managed to come with a standard phase, right? So it's quite smooth. And I say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an analyst with so-and-so, right? Um, I'm currently doing a research on the textile industry. So the reason for my call is actually, I'm trying to understand more about the industry. So I wonder if you can spare some time with me to actually, for me, ask you a few questions. So it's, it becomes very smooth. <laughs> so nine out of 10 is a no, you know, but, but the one that's willing to share, you do really learn a lot from it, a lot, really, really learn a lot, okay. right? So this is where the learning curve starts from. So again, most of my knowledge in across the industries are actually not from internet, not from Google, or even not from what. It's actually from all these interviews. And these are all unlisted companies. They're all the Sendian brands. So that's why when you meet one that's really willing to share, they are really willing to share. So they really teach you about the dynamics of the industry, how it works, so on and so forth. Mm. So... I, I, just, I think it's a very good training ground because you, you really learn firsthand what is really happening rather than I just rely on, on, on Bloomberg, you know, oh, sorry, just rely on internet, on Google to actually search for this. Okay. Um, I still remember the KPI my boss set for me that night. His KPI to me is, I don't want to see you in your, in your place. He said, if every day I come and I see you sitting in your place, you're not doing your job. So he, he wants me to get out of the office as frequent so, so my, my daily job is just to roam around. You just roam, no, okay, not to roam. I always find places to go. Right? It's either I'm, I'm visiting this factory or I'm visiting the, I'm going there, I'm talking to this uh, regulator, I'm going to visit MCMC, you know, things like that. So I always keep my days occupied running around the industry. So that, that's where the real research is from okay. and really not from Googling and, and things like that. This, this reminds me of... Um... One thing that you've always been very at a huge advocate about is that analyst, being an analyst doesn't necessarily give you an advantage over uh, being a retailer. A retailer can do as well as an analyst when it comes to choosing uh, the right investment. Am I right yeah. to say that? Yes, it is. Yeah. You see, okay, the, the, the fundamental behind this is that with investors, almost even retailers, right? We always assume we need a lot of stocks to be successful in investment, mm. right? That's not the case. You can even do extremely well with only one stock, two stocks, or even five stocks. But the caveat is, you know those stocks very, very well. Mm. Right? So, say for instance, if you are a chemist, right, and you know the chemical industry very, very well, you can, if you invest in just the right chemical company, that's it. The, right? But the biggest problem is you have assuming a chemist, uh, but he don't like to invest in chemists. He likes to invest in banking stocks, which you know nothing about. He likes to dabble in biotechnology, which he also don't know nothing about. You, you see where I'm coming from? Mm. So 
as long as you invest based on your circle of competency, you can do very well. And really, no, I am, I'm not a believer of diversification. I always say that you only diversify if you don't know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, why diversify? Okay. You, you see where I'm coming from? Yeah. So yes, retailers can have even a better edge compared with analysts on the, on the basis if they focus on what they're good at and not try to go into territories where they're totally not familiar with. Okay, okay. And that brings me to my next question, right? Because I know that ultimately what one should invest in is very important to consult what your main objective is. And as you mm -hmm. mentioned, if my goal is 10% this year, once I hit that 10%, I should be happy. I should maybe de-risk myself off uh, some of the holdings that I have. But how does one come to an objective? And maybe a better question would be, um, yeah, just how does one come to a good objective? Because I feel like at my point in life, a lot of the objective is not being set by myself. And I, I remember hearing you say about how important self-awareness and self-understanding is. Um, but yeah, how does one come to a good objective? How does one know what's a good objective for oneself? There's no good objective. A good objective is simply a realistic objective that works for you. Mm. That's it, right? So what I mean by realistic is, I always use this example, right? What, what is a realistic return for a Malaysian market over the long term, let's say the long term, right? Mm. I will take it averagely at about 7 to 8%. So as long as you, you have an objective that is above 7 8%, right? That is reasonable. On the other hand of the spectrum, we have the world best fund manager, which is Warren Buffett, right? His return is 20% every year, Kager per annum. Mm. So to me, anything between that range is reasonable. But what I mean by not being objective is, you know, I hear a lot of people say, you know, I, my Kager is 50%. And I was like, uh, you, you have to come, come to the ground first to realize this, right? But I do have people making that claim, say, hey, you know, my Kager is 50%, so on and so forth, right? Um, I usually have two answers. I said, there's only two possible reasons you can get that kind of performance. Mm -hmm. First thing is, you, know, you have just started and then you don't have a long enough time frame to average now. Maybe it's a one-year return or two-year return. That's mm -hmm. it. Like even last year, for instance, right, I think everybody can claim the double digits. Right? It's so easy, right? But you try to stretch it for five, six years, like that's a different story. And I said, the second possibility is they could be lying to you. That's it, right? So that's me being, being realistic. So I will usually guide Malaysian investors in a sense, I said, what is a reasonable return for Malaysia that I think is a, is a reasonable target? Mm. I said 10 to 12% is actually a very reasonable target. Okay. Reasonable, right? Not, not to say, at, at least not to the moon, you know, not that kind of <laughs> level. Well, it's something quite, quite reasonable, achievable in, in that sense. So that's what I mean by being realistic about the objective. Okay. Okay. So you got to benchmark, somewhat benchmark it with um, the index of the, the places that you are investing in. Is it fair to say? If I'm investing in the US market, should I benchmark it with the S&P or the Dow Jones index though? Is this something it is like an interesting, this is an interesting part. Right? It's about benchmark, right? You remember all the leap earth performance I was talking about, right? all, all the awards, right? The yeah. awards actually come from benchmark. Okay. If you are a private investor, if you're a personal investor, why, who, who do, why would you want to benchmark with the index? You, you see where I'm coming from? Mm. Who, who are you competing with? No one. Okay. So what if you outperform the index? Also, what if you underperform the index? This year index is up by 50%. I'm only up by 30%. So, I mean, you, you see I'm coming from it? Yeah. There, there's no point to compete with the index because you get nothing out of it. Okay, okay. You, you see that mindset? The, the mindset I'm trying to shift. So if your target is 10% return, this mm -hmm. year you get 30%. The index is 50%. So what? You, you see But people go some way. I'm underperforming the index. So, but you outperform your own objective. Okay, okay. I see where yeah. you're coming from. And this reminds me of one thing that I have always um, kind of struggled with because I think a lot of these benchmarks, a lot of this, um, a lot of these benchmarks are very arbitrary. For example, mm -hmm. right, let's say if my return last year was 8%, all the way up to 31st December, I'm like, oh, say, oh, so sad, 8% only, everyone make 10, 15%. But come January 31st, if that 8% has grown to 25%, where someone mm -hmm. is still stuck with that 12% or 13% because of, hey, this one company they invested in that really needed that time to really just reflect share price-wise. Hey, I'm 
by default a success, but I had a crappy last year. But who yeah. knows, maybe February comes along, my stock drops by 50% and then it goes all over the place. So um, something for me to think about, like, something for me to personally think yes. about because this annual return kind of benchmark is not the most accurate one in my opinion. It's a good point. Remember, you're asking me about this spirituality where I say it's a journey and not a destiny. Right? <laughs> yeah. You, you, you see this perspective of it? Okay, okay. Thank you for linking that together. I do, I do. This next question I want to ask is um, one of your one of your highlights in your career uh, when it comes to investing. I'm not sure if you would call it that, but when I read it, I'm like, whoa, this guy, wow, this guy very, very ballsy to do that. Huh? In 2008, um, there was a financial crisis yeah. and a lot of people are very scared and mm. they didn't dare to make, make any move. But mm. you ignored the market uncertainty, you ignored the fear, you call it a mega sale mm. uh, in 2008, where you have friends around you, peers around you saying that you're crazy, you're buying into this stock and that stock at this point. Could you share with me why you thought that, thought so though? Why did you think that was a good time to get into stocks? And the same thing happened last year, March, remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's what we'll get into later, right? But in 20, 2008, what was, what was the thing that made you so, had such a strong conviction to going deep? I, 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 I like to look at things in a very simple basis, simplify mm. things, right? Okay. To me, how do I define as a financial crisis? A financial crisis usually happens when there's a liquidity crunch, when there's no liquidity, right? I mean to say when there's no liquidity, um, banks are short of cash. So when banks are short of cash, consumer credits are in, in, in a problem, in issue, businesses are having issues because they can't get access to them. Mm. But what really triggered me, I found very interesting that time in 2008 was, US bank cash balances are at all time high. Mm. And that, that, was even, that was even before the QE. You're talking about before QE or quantitative easing, right? So I asked myself this question, were it possible to have a financial crisis when banks have ample of cash and not, not the ample of cash, have all time historical high level of cash in their balance sheet. Would it be possible for a financial crisis to happen? Very unlikely. I, I don't think so. And second thing is that time, the panic that time was write down impairments on the subprime loans. Mm. So these are paper losses. No, it's just an impairment and impairment and impairments, right? So they are not really the losses. What was not really published was like, I can't remember the Fed steps in and the step, Fed and Federal Reserve start to buy all those papers from the market. I, I can't remember exactly the, the number, but by 2012, 2013, the Federal Reserve actually made billions of these so-called junk papers. So there's actually values to it, but it's just because of all the impairments that you know, the value has been destroyed. So that, that was a very simplistic perspective to it that I don't think that the world is going to go down mm. because the banks have ample of liquidity in the balance sheet. 2020 then, March, what was the indie, what, what gave you so much conviction? I, I assume it's a very different scenario than 2008. It's a very diff different scenario because first, first thing is the, mark, the, the the speed of the drop was very, very fast. Mm. I, I did a comparison last year. I think one of the presenting last year I did, right? See, in 2008, mm. it, took, it took the S&P close to nine months to hit, to drop 30%. Mm. In, two, in last year, March, two weeks, 30%. Mm. It's that velocity. In just two weeks, you're actually comparable to the great financial crisis. What happened in nine months, yeah. you resolve it in two weeks or you just wrap the whole thing down in two weeks. That's number one. Number two is the global effort. Okay. 2008, you're talking about QE started first with the US, gradually being followed by other countries, your Europe, gradually, right? But this is the first time in history, it's simultaneous. The amount of liquidity being injected into the, each country right, is as close as simultaneous. Very, very uh, at the same timing. And, and the amount is huge. We're talking about 12% of GDP injection, 15% of GDP, 18% of GDP, right? Mm. And never fight with liquidity. Okay. Whenever liquidity comes into the market, right? As bearish as you are, you'll be wrong. Mm. Because ultimately, what are all this liquidity looking for? They're looking for returns. Has that view changed though? Up to today, we've been one year and three months uh, beyond that. This is where the dilemma I'm facing now. Oh, it's a very tough call at the moment. Mm. For me, on one hand, I will think globally, not only, not, not so much Malaysia, globally, the market are not 
undervalued anymore. They're not cheap anymore, right? Mm. But on the other hand, there's still a lot of liquidity in the market. Okay. So it really put you in that situation that it's really a tough call. You know, what do you want to call? On one hand, you say, yes, I admit that market is not cheap. It's expensive. But on the other hand, it's supported by there's still a lot of liquidity out there. Mm-hmm. So you it, see, it's, it's a very, very tough call. I see, I see. Well, you know, a wise man would say, universe will decide for you. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you for indulging in some of the um, some yeah. of the investment questions. I'm gonna try to wrap up. I don't take up too much of your time, um, but I, I'm very curious about your book writing process and book book writing journey, because oh. uh, as I shared with you before, I'm trying to finish a book on my own as well. Uh, it's taking it's proving to take much more out of me, uh, my sanity rather than anything. Uh, what did it take? How did your journey to writing the book look like? Um, it's actually driven by two, two events, mm. right? Um, the first one is, of course, I, I must thank uh, <laughs> Ho Ching Soon, right? You know, shout out to him. Yeah, shout out to Ho Ching Soon. Um, he actually made me commit to actually write a book by a certain day. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it was a, it was a, like the commitment to write a book. He, he gave me 12 months to write a book. Right, so I was like, uh, I was non-committed at first. I was like, yeah, committed, but committed, but non-committed in that sense, right? So the second aspect of motivation was come from, um, I remember, I think it was two, 2010, I actually brought um, the school children, or some of my school children in, in my charity school. Mm. We brought them to visit this place called Fu Ong San in Selangor, right? There's this temple built by a Taiwanese Buddhist monastery, mm. right? So I remember they played a video about the founder in Taiwan. Then he was actually explaining where he raised the funds to actually build all these temples that he have. So he was then explaining, okay, see, see this pagoda is built by this book about Kuan Ying that I wrote. Uh, see this bridge is built by this book about Buddhism that I wrote. Huh. So the founder actually write books about Buddhism. Of course, sell in the market. It's, that's what happened in Taiwan. No, actually books are being sold. Yeah. And the process actually, he used it to actually build the temple. So, so that actually got me thinking. He said, you know, why don't I also, since I promised Ho Ching Soon, right? So why don't I write a book and I, I let the process go to charity. So try to Im- copy what he's doing. And then of course, with the wildest dream, I said, hey, you know, if my book can be sold for the next 10, 20 years or permanently, right? Yeah. At, at least there's a constant income being generated for, for it. So th- that's what got me started. But again, I was very reluctant because I, I don't foresee myself to be a, 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 a guru level to be qualified to write a book. So that, that was the first, really was the first struggle. And, and the first sentences that came out of my mind that I wrote as the first, to remember it was the beginning of the book. I'm not Warren Buffett, Buffett and I'm not Charlie Munger. Mm. I'm, and nor do I consider myself as an investment guru. Yeah. So that, that was the first thought that I think I should really admit it that I know I'm not at the level to actually write a book about investment, but I'm just wanting to write it as a method for me to share my knowledge. Well, I want to say, that I think that first sentence uh, saying that you're not Buffett or you're not uh, Charlie Munger attracted more people than pushed them away. It was your Peter uh. Lim. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah. okay. So I, I hear what I hear you say is that it's very important to have kind of like a deadline set like, because otherwise you'll forever be like a fantasy or a project with no end in sight, right? In that 12 month period, did you have to rush through that 12 month period? No, actually, I completed the book in two months. Oh, yo, okay. Yeah. So that goes your three minute story, yeah, uh, in uh, in your in your first job as an analyst. <laughs> okay, okay, I can see a pattern to uh, how Peter does things really slowly building up as this podcast goes closer and closer to the end. Okay, um, this is a very general question, and I want to ask it because actually I don't know whether you covered it or not. Uh, okay, but I'll ask it anyway, right? It is sad that we've come to measure a person's uh, worth based on his net worth. Um, mm. uh, that is very sad how we are taught to measure success. Uh. And do you think money buys happiness? Okay. I do agree that money don't buy happiness. Right? Mm. I mean, happiness is something... See, again, that the kind of happiness you're talking about. There are a lot of fleeting happiness. The fleeting happiness that when you open your first iPhone or you, know, you got your first, you got your watch actually received in the mail. Mm. Those are fleeting happiness. Right? So can money buy fleeting happiness? Answer, of course, is yes. Right, it can. But 
if you look at the other aspect of happiness, which is internally true happiness that comes from within, mm-hmm. that one is really something that is not something can be exchanged. That money can't buy that happiness. But I do remember there's a very interesting quote that came from many, many years ago, right? I, I, I think there's truth to it. They said, well, money can't buy you happiness. But I'm definitely happier when I'm rich and sad compared with when I'm poor and sad. <laughs> I remember you sharing that in one of your Facebook updates. <laughs> it has some, some certain truth to it, right? Mm, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. So if, if I would ask you, if you were to put a number on, on, um, I, okay, this is very popular because you know the, the FIRE community, the financially independent retire early. Uh, the, the way they advocate how much one should have is uh, to determine what your what your monthly spending is. Let's say if my monthly spending is three thousand ringgit, if I can reach a point in life where I can have a passive return of that three thousand ringgit, I am financially free in a way. What do you think is an amount that you be happy with personally? If a rough amount, and I know I know you have a huge responsibility. You have to run your school. You have to run your charity. But what do you think that number is? Can you define that number? Have a, a very different aspect to this. Right? The mm. first thing is, you see, when I was young, of course, we always talk about I want to retire age of 40, uh, age of 50, so on and so forth, right? Mm-hmm. But if you take a step back, right? If you enjoy what you're doing, mm. would the question of retirement ever comes to mind? Okay, good point. So I, I, only I come to the point, I really never thought of retiring or never come to mind because if, if, uh, if you really enjoy what you're doing, right? Mm. Why, why should I retire from it? No, I will continue to do it, right? So see, retirement comes, become an issue is when you retire and you stop your productive activities and you start earning income. I see. And that's where you start to count, you know, how much money do I have in my nest egg. But if you really enjoy what you're doing, right? You're not stopping what you're doing, okay. right? The flow of income will continue to come. Of course, it can be lesser, but th- there's no issue of you need to touch into your nest egg. I see. Okay, that's, that's the first aspect. The second aspect is based on example, you see, okay, you need you need to spend three thousand sustain this amount. But you see that you're assuming that you can control your desire for the next 20, 30 years. Mm-hmm. You can live with three thousand flat, but let's be realistic. Do you think it's possible? No, no, right? No, we, we have desire. Yeah. As a human being, see, some people say I got no desire, which I think is not true. Because if you really got no desire, please go and die. <laughs> Okay, okay. The, the reason we are still alive because there's this inherent <laughs> desire to continue to live. Mm. Right? If you are already a desireless person, then why are you still living on this face of earth? You see where I'm coming from? Yeah, yeah. So again, another challenge to that is you're really assuming you're able to constrain your de- desire to actually 3,000 for the rest of your life, which again, I don't think is possible. I understand. And this right. is where the term uh, curb your desire comes in because and this is something I'm curious about because I, I suppose the reason why spirituality is something of a, a pursuit of mine is because I feel like desires uh, are the foundations of uh, unhappiness down the road, right? And mm. if one can manage or handle the desire, one can be, I suppose the word, the huge word is enlightened. What, what do you think about that? What do you think about reducing your desires in general? No, you see, being alive is being alive. Mm. Being alive means to say you live your life in this world to accordingly to what the life brings to you. Mm-hmm. So it's not about curbing your desire. It's really, are your desires something that is, again, realistic, achievable, or is your desire is something that's totally out of this world? Mm. The problem is never with desire. I say desire is an inherent aspect of human being. The reason every self of us are still alive because there's a desire to live. Now what if I ask you, curb your desire to live? Are you going to be half dead, half paralyzed? I, I, you see I'm coming from? Mm. So what, what is more, more, I want to say more profound, more, more in reality is that it is about whether your desire is something that is achievable or something that is, will be actually bring benefit to you. Okay, okay. You see I'm coming from? So if you align your desire, so desire is not bad. It's whether your desire is something that at the end of the day will bring benefit to you. And is it really something realistic? I see. So that, that is more of an issue, right? For instance, if I desire a yacht, for instance, right? Yeah, it's a design, but how would that yacht bring value to me, benefit to me in my life? No, 
right? But you said if you desire another thing, say, okay, if this if I desire to actually contribute a thousand ringgit to old folks home every day, it's a desire. Mm. But it's a different type of desire. So desire is not the issue. The issue is more of what kind of desire that you have within you. All right. So make an interesting point about it. Say curbing your desire, right? So think about it. So you will be retired, you have a nest egg that can support you for a lifetime, but you're not happy. <laughs> Very common sign, huh? <laughs> no, you, you just, you got, yeah, I know every month I got 3,000, but I'm not happy because I cannot spend more. Mm. I cannot buy the thing that I want to buy. Mm. Yeah, but you have enough for the rest of your life. You can live for the rest of your life, but you'll be unhappy for the rest of your life. Okay. So are you living your life? <laughs> got it, got it. I think, I think what, what I'm hearing from you say is, um, yeah, it's more important to be more in tune with your desire and hopefully you can also figure out a retirement plan or retirement career that can satisfy that desire through, through work. I'm not yeah. sure if I make any sense or not, but that's, that's what, it's a picture you paint in my mind. So many pictures you paint in my mind today, really. The Holy Man <laughs> picture is one. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to try to wrap it up. I know we've taken a lot of your time. But one question I'm curious because I, I know the panoramic view, which I'm subscribed to, everyone should subscribe to as well. <laughs> starts <laughs> from starts from a passion. It starts from a passion yeah. of yours to to help the everyday retailer make um make sound decisions in investing. Uh, and I I I hear the word passion come up in this conversation quite a bit, especially in the last bit when you talk about finding a reason to live. Right, once you reach retirement, would you say passion is a good guide to making some of these life decisions? Though. Wait, I wouldn't say whether it's passion a good guy in life, mm. but you have to live your life according to your passion. If you're not living your life according to your passion, your life is wasted. Then boils down to the earlier point. No, are you living or are you being alive? Most of us, are, we are just living, but we are not alive. We are not living our life. Mm. So when you are living our life is when you're engaged with your passion be it whatever it is. So that is where being passionate or being involved in the thing that you're passionate about mm. is being alive. Okay. And your passion currently would be, what would you say it is? I will say it's more of, in a very loosely term, I will say more on financial education. Or, okay, maybe not financial education, right? I would say more of financial literacy, right? Like I, I didn't mention this panoramic view. Mm. Um, it's really out of passion. Um, is it profitable? Uh, honestly, no. I just received my accounts from my accountant. <laughs> it's it's loss making. So, but but the, the reason is not bothering me. Okay, I say it's not bo it's not bothering me so much because it is it's not something I ventured out because to make money out of it. Mm. It's really to me. It's really maybe you can say it's, it's it's my passion for financial literacy. Okay. That I view that the impact I have on investors is more then more important than the losses that I'm making for it. Okay. It's a very noble thing. Uh, I mean, goosebumps hearing you say that, Peter. Thank you so <laughs> much for what you do. Okay, this, this segues to this next question. Education, literacy. I know that's very important to you. Hence, you run a school. And I know you run a school until I had to deliver the, the books and the stuff to you. Uh, but you run a school. And mm. I think looking at one of, one of the biggest challenges that we face as a nation this year is the education sector. You were not allowed to open for the longest time. And when you did open, you had cases surging and you had kids having to go through online education to real life education, only back to going online again in the span of just a few weeks, right? It's a lot of chaos for lack of a better word. How do you view the future of education? Because, and the reason I ask this is because I find that the most learning that I've achieved, at least in the last few years of my life, right, um, is not through a formal course where I sit down uh, three months, two months, one semester and go through this whole syllabus and exam. I learned the most through some of the conversations I have uh, that you share with some of the sharings online that you do. I learned the most through uh, interactive courses or interactive programs that, I, that I'm able to participate in. Um, and just how do, you feel, how do you view the future of education? I think again, there is no straight answer, it's multiple aspects, right? As mm. much as we want to believe that the future of education is online, 
you must also take into consideration of those those who can't afford. Mm. They can't afford either they are not able to actually get the gadgets to actually access online and or they don't have the enough internet connectivity to be able to get online. Mm. Right? Because you see, education is a law. It's, it's like a birthright. It is actually under, if you look at under our, even our law, education is something that is a birthright that everyone needs to have access to education. Mm. Have to have access to education. But if you, for all this digital push, is it really possible to actually push to even those rural areas where they have this issue? You, you see I'm coming from? Yeah. So that, that's, that's the first aspect of online education, right? There, there are still really challenges to actually, just if you continue to push for it, the divide between the have and the have not will even wider, mm. get even much wider. You get a very good example, you know, the recent case about this para issue, right? You, know, you, you have this very kind, kind corporation who actually donated, don't know, tens of thousands of Food. mobile device apparently for uh, studying at home, but there are limitations to what the device can do. Okay. Right? You, 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 you yep. see, yeah, I read about that. But I, I'm kind of aspect. I'm, I'm actually, my heart goes to the students there where they can't afford all these devices mm. and they can't actually have a proper learning. That, that's number one. Number two is the future of education all move to online. I want to actually point out very correctly. I think education is not so much really on the textbook, but it's really the, the values in the human interaction. Right? You know, when you go to school, be it primary, be it secondary, right? I think what you learn more is really the interaction with your with your fellow classmates, you know, the recess time, you no, know, everybody just looks so forward to actually recess, recess time. You no, know, it, it's the experience that actually brings you the whole education per se and the bring the whole experience. That's actually more. So will online actually move towards pure online? Actually move to pure online? I think it, it, it really does happen that way. You actually will take away a lot of those valuable experience where actually students will actually go through and actually benefit themselves. Yep, yep. I 100% agree with that because I really cannot wait till the day that I sign up for a lot of courses that uh, the reason why I signed up for it is because I am looking forward to being able to attend it in person, live, meeting the coaches, meeting the students, meeting fellow like-minded people to learn together. Because um, as much as great internet speed, a great screen, a great computer can do a lot of that, it's just not the same for me. Yeah. And I just want to echo what you just said, right? Because I find that this concept called edutainment, 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 education plus entertainment, I think it has been very much used and very much misunderstood. But I find that a lot of my learning, especially learnings that really stick to me, is when I'm able to learn and I'm able to have fun. And maybe the definition of fun can be very different from person to person. But for me, fun is when I can really mingle with people, interact with people and learn at the same time. So maybe that, that's something that I've always been very interested in because I, I realized that learning never happens if there's no entertainment. Uh, it's a personal <laughs> belief of mine. Okay, um, Peter, I have a few more rapid fire questions for you. Uh, short questions. It, the answers doesn't necessarily have to be short. You can take your sweet, sweet time with it. Um, if you could put up a billboard on the busiest street in KL, what would it say? Be alive. Be alive? Yeah. You're alive? No, be, be alive. Yeah, okay, sorry. Be alive. Most of us are living. Most of us are not being alive. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Can you why why do you why do you say that? Why would you say that? Uh you see, when you said the busiest street, right? Mm. The first thing that I might know are a lot of the hustle and bustle, you know, people rushing for their job, rushing for their work. Imagine those typical hustle and bustle, those interjections, right? Mm. I think most of us have forgotten that why we're here. We're here to be alive, to experience life as it is. Mm. But we are so busy about chasing after uh well, chasing after material things, chasing after so-called happiness or material happiness, chasing after income, status, that we really forgotten that, you no, know, why we are here? We are here to actually be alive, mm. to experience mm -hmm. life as it is. Got it, got it. Profound statement, thank you. We think about that one. You, you're leaving me with more questions than answers by today's podcast <laughs> and conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's the same for listeners as well, which is great. I mean, great questions lead to great answers, right? Um, what would you tell your 20-year-old self? Don't change anything. See, of course, we, when we look back, right, there are definitely a lot of times where 
we regretted making some decisions, right? We, we have to get, we, we shouldn't have done this, we shouldn't have done that, or we have, we have done this better, we have come that better. But on the other hand of it, we must also come to terms, right? It is all those mistakes that mold us to who we are today. If without those mistakes, you wouldn't be you today, and I wouldn't be me today, right? So assuming you have to go back time, will I change or will I do things any differently? I think the answer is no. Okay, okay. So last question, what would you ask your 50 year old self? <laughs> what what were us? How do you survive for so long? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're not going to review your age, but okay, thank you for that answer. <laughs> um, all right, Peter. Um, I just want to ask, where can people connect with you and follow your work, though? This is. A- uh, I have my Facebook page, which mm-hmm. is uh my name Peter Lim with a picture of a bald guy. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Mo- most of my my sharing will actually be there. Sometimes, sometimes a bit, okay, I want to say sometimes, I think most of the time I tend to have this bad habit of being sarcastic for some reason on, on, on most occasions. Yeah, so it's, it's one, one of those channels where I get to uh, vent out my sarcasm for no reason. <laughs> okay, okay. It's very entertaining, I have to say. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, I want to say, I think one of, um, as we move towards a more digital world, and I think most people are trying to for lack of a better word, do a personal brand per se. I think personal branding is not so much just about putting out a nice picture and then a nice uh, catchy inspirational caption because that's very fake, right? And I think mm-hmm. you sharing your thoughts and being who you are online is the reason why you have such a uh, avid and loyal following on social media. Like, and don't stop doing <laughs> that as much as, as it pisses someone, uh, some people off, don't stop doing that. Don't stop being who you are on Facebook or your sharings, like, I just want to say. I almost <laughs> forget, okay, one thing that our camera guy Gabriel wanted me to ask is how are you cutting your hair during this period of MCO? It's a very important <laughs> question. In my memory, I think Gabriel got a lot of hair, right? I mean, it should be something that he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> I shift my own, I shift my own. Okay, yeah. okay. So Gabriel, there you got your answer, all right? Okay, uh, just a quick quote. Uh, this is a quote that you shared and I'm going to read it off the screen. Uh, during this period, choose to be thankful. There are those with no homes to call to daily wage earners with no earnings, elderly and special needs not able to get provisions. Choose to love, choose to spread kindness. Even a small act like giving food or provisions to those in need makes the world a much better place to live in. Peter Lim, 2021. 2020, sorry, 2020. Which is still valid at 2021 and even at 2050. All right. Okay, Peter, um, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a very entertaining conversation which as I mentioned has gotten me thinking a lot a lot more questions and answers really okay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your time and oh, thank you thank, uh, thank you thank you so much for all your sharing and for those who want to follow Peter I'll leave all the descriptions all the links to his this, to his uh, stuff in the description uh, whether it's on YouTube or on Spotify when you're listening to this alright thank you so much bye everyone thank you bye bye bye